All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll continue with our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we worship you this morning. We, we so enjoy learning more about who you are, that yes, you are the awesome, indescribable God of this universe, the creator of all that we see and can imagine. But you also are a personal God that reaches down to us and you love us individually so much that you sent your son to die in our place. So we praise you for all these things. And it's our prayer this morning that everything that takes place, every, every song that's sung, every, every verse of scripture we study, each of these things will bring honor and glory to you and you alone. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Lost, but he brought me and oh his love for me oh his love for me through the sunset spring oh his redeemed I'm a child of God yes I Not forsaken, I am who you 
decision for the first time or just a, a remi- reminder to re- realign your thoughts and your, your focus back to uh, Jesus and what he offers us. So come to the altar.
joy from the ashes in you. chapter 20. If you find that just towards the end of the book, you'll be ready to roll, and then we'll move back again towards the first chapter. John chapter 20 is where we'll start, though. A letter received by the Conscience Fund, that's actually the name of it, in the U.S. government stated the following. It said, please accept this money for two postal stamps that I reused. You get the point there. You're not meant to reuse a stamp, right? Okay. This person did. I mean, two stamps. But their conscience got to bother them so much that they actually sent in money for it. Another person, true story, this is all true. Another person seeking relief from their guilt wrote, About eight years ago, I took from a railroad station an item worth about $25. So I've enclosed $50 to clear my conscience. These are, these are true letters. Since 1811... Now, catch this. Since 1811, the U.S. Department of Treasury has received literally millions of dollars because of guilty consciences. These are voluntary contributions. They've not been caught, but what happened? Well, you see, why would people do that? Well, I think we all know, and we're going to see it today. 
The weight of guilt eventually catches up with all of us, doesn't it? And it is a weight that is too much for us to bear. Let's pray. Let's pray together as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, as we, as we look into your word this morning, the scriptures, the Bible, your love letter to us, whatever we want to call it, as we look into it today, please help us to remember what it is we're studying. It's not a textbook. It's not something written by man. It is your word to us because you love us, and there are things that you know we need to know. So this morning as we study this, help us to be alert. Help us to be concentrating on your truth. Help me to speak clearly and accurately and slowly. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to be responders to your word today. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Most of us enjoy watching a good movie, right? Yeah, we do. We enjoy watching a good movie. Um, but I'll tell you, there's, um, there's, it's, it's much more interesting, and Beverly and I, we enjoy watching movies, but, but when, when there's this one line that scrolls up on the screen before a movie, it always amps our, our, our concentration and our interest a lot more. What's, what's that line that you see sometimes before movies? Anybody want to guess? I'll get the guys to put it on the screen. This is a true story. Right? Don't you, don't you really enjoy movies and it's based on, on, on a real event? Why? Well, I mean, you know, I know that people have great imaginations and they write amazing books and sometimes they're made into movies. And even though it's not true, it's, it's really interesting. But when it's a, it's a movie based on real events, you know, th- th- we know somebody lived through this. Somebody survived this. Somebody endured this. Somebody had the joy really in their life that you see happening in that movie. I don't know about you, but for Reverend, I just amps it up. I just, I just love movies like that because of, of the reality of them. And so I don't want you to miss this today as we, as we study together. Because what we're reading in this study, <clears throat> this is real. Okay, This is not anyone's imagination. And as these accounts we're going to study over these, over these coming weeks, as they unfold... They are going to reveal more and more and more of the truth about who Jesus Christ really is. And so I want us to, to take these things in. Something else I've enjoyed about this study, as I've been preparing for it, and I hope you'll enjoy it as we, as we share it together, is the fact that you see so often in our minds, we, we look at the three years of Christ's ministry on this earth and, you know, we think about the different events that take place, the, his mentoring of the disciples, him speaking to, to large groups of people, his, um, his confrontations with the Pharisees, his acts of amazing kindness that he pours out on people, the miracles, all these things, they just kind of mix together in our heads, and, it's, and we kind of lose track of which happened when and what's first and, and what's last. And that's important. It's like with any historical event, the chronology... The order of it does matter. And so hopefully in our study, we're going to be able to kind of put it together a bit better when it comes together, how it falls in place, such as what we looked at last week. We learned that there were five men who first came to see. You know, as we're studying during this year, come and see. That was Jesus' first words, come and see. There were five men who were the first to come and see. Who were they? Don't look at the screen yet. Who were those five? Who were those five? Yeah, you got most of them. Okay, put, put it back up there, guys. That's right. Okay, you had a little bit of help there, though, didn't you? They were the first five who came to see. They came to have a look. And what we, what we learn as we, as we study through the New Testament is, and this is quite interesting, that they stayed with Jesus for about four months, okay, in the first stage. I'm going to tell you what, what happens after the four months. You'll find that out probably next week we'll get to that. They're with him for four months, and they're watching they're checking him out. They're saying, you know, what's this about? Because you see, as Christianity is based on Christ, right? I mean, it's kind of part of the name itself, right? As Christianity is based on Christ, then it's important to understand who he is. And you think about these, these men, these five men, and, and, and for us in our lives, and for some of you here who are right now still seeking, you're trying to figure this all out, you know, if this, if this Jesus Christ is going to be able to enable a person to have a right relationship with the God of this universe, are you picturing that 
That's, that's a huge leap. Then he himself must be, must be God. He must be the son of God. Or else he can't do that. And so what evidence does he give to demonstrate that he can? Well, that's what's going to take place. And we're going to be seeing some things this morning. We talked about this last week. You'll remember, this, this is a great evidence of God's love for us in that he didn't just send his son to say to us, believe in me or else. He did far from that. He said, believe in me. That's your way to the Father. But let me show you good reasons why you should. Let me, let me, let me show you. And that's exactly what he goes about doing. I've had you turn to John chapter 20 to start off. So look at the, towards the end of the chapter there, verses 30 and 31. We looked at these verses last week. <clears throat> we read, Now Jesus did many other signs, in other words, amazing events, in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, why? This is cool. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, by believing you may have life in his name. Why did he do those things? You know, why did he heal people? Because they were sick. But yeah, like I said last week, there were also lots of people that didn't get healed. Why were these healed? Why do these things take place that we're going to be studying? So that people could say, wow, he says he's the Son of God, and who could doubt it? Look what he's able to do. And because we have God's word preserved today, we can see that same evidence today. So as you take a brief look at these events, if you're seeking, if you're trying to figure this all out, notice carefully what he accomplishes. If you know Christ, if there's been that time already in your life where you turn from living life your way, you, you are willing to believe in him that he is the one that can forgive your sins. He is the one that can bring you a relationship to the God of this universe, then see these things in you. Allow them to strengthen your relationship in him and enable you to help others to see the way to Jesus Christ. So, we're going to come to the first thing this morning, and it's his first miracle. It's his first miracle, so go back to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. As you turn back to John chapter 2... Once again, we're, we're, we're kind of looking at Jesus' life chronologically here, and this seems the best of our information to be the first miracle that Jesus performed. So we'll start with verse 1, John 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, we got to put ourselves in the context of the first century, all right? Um, that today wouldn't be a big issue, but it was a pending tragedy in that era. I mean, of course, for one reason today, you know, they're out of something to drink, so they couldn't just pop over to pack and save and grab some more. Didn't work that way in that era. Also, you got to understand how weddings took place in that day. Often, weddings lasted for seven days. You fathers of the bride, aren't you glad they don't last... Seven days today, you know? Seven days. So you can, you can first of all, see why they went, ran out of wine. And number two, you can see that, you know, well, this is a problem. And it's actually an insult. You see, because it was up to the groom to provide food and drink for these people for seven days. Okay? And, and if he ran out, then it's an insult to his, to his guests. It's as though he didn't really cherish them enough. Well, let's see what's going to happen. Verse 4. Verse 4. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, this kind of brings two questions to our mind. And you probably, you probably kind of, your mind kind of probably jerked a bit there. It, it would appear Jesus is being disrespectful to his mother there, which would not be in character in who we believe Jesus is. Is that the case? Well, no, actually, that's not the case. In that culture... That was an expression of endearment to a, to a mother. You guys, I don't encourage you to try it today. In this era, you might not survive the event, right? Okay. But in that era, it was. In fact, I'll give you, a, I'll get the guys to put it on the screen. John 19, 26. Jesus used the same expression when he's on the cross. He's dying. And, and notice this about Jesus. He's on the cross, probably enduring more horrific physical pain than any human being has ever endured plus bearing the weight of the sin of the world of himself. And instead of saying, oh, man, this hurts, he's worrying about his mother. Wow, who is this guy? And he said, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. 
And obviously this is in time of endearment. So that's, he's not being disrespectful. And it's also likely, just kind of understanding the context, that Jesus was actually saying this to help his mother understand that he's transitioning now. Okay? She has been his mother. He, he, he and will always be his, his mother in that sense. He will always respect her. But now his actual ministry time has begun. And so now his focus is on his Father in heaven, and his Father in heaven will direct his steps, his steps because Jesus understands clearly that he is beginning the, the, the march, the forward movement that will take him to the point where he will redeem lost mankind, the most important act of all historic existence. And so he's helping her understand, you know, like, like mom, some things are going to change now. And I think she probably gets it there at that point. Look at verse 6. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Okay, we've probably all washed our hands over the last months more than normal because of the COVID stuff, okay? All right. But we've got to understand the culture once again. You see, in that era, in, for, for the Jews in that culture, they washed their hands a lot, and not so much to keep germs off, okay? It was more... Um, ceremonial and even traditional purification. For example, if they touched a Gentile, that made them unclean. All right? That was just part of, part of the Old Testament, part of things they had amped up above what even God taught. It was ceremonial and cleanness, so they had to have a lot of water around for that. The total content of those jars, the best we can figure, probably about 600 liters. That's a lot of, that's a lot of water, right? Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, filled jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Hang on, I think I jumped over something here, didn't I? Did I miss reading some things here? Yeah, no, we're good, we're good, okay. Pick it up again. So Jesus said to the servants, fill, fill jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, Now draw some out. They take it to the master of the feast, so they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, notice that, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee and manifested his glory Notice that showed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, we get the point here, don't we? Quite obviously, there is no human being who can, can take plain water and turn it into wine, right? If, if, if someone could do that, they would be very, very wealthy, right? And they would shut down Hawks Bay economy because a lot of vineyards would be closed down. I mean, who needs grapes anymore, right? You can just turn water into wine. But people can't do that. But this man did. This man did. That cannot be ignored. And I'll assure you on that day it was not ignored. Now, you could say, well, yeah, but I mean... Just because the Bible said it happened doesn't mean it happened, right? Well, let's, let's, let's look at that for a moment. Why don't you go to, so you're in John. Hold your place in John. Just go back to Luke, the book right before John. Go to Luke chapter 1 while I tell you a, a true account, okay? So hold your place in John. Go to Luke chapter 1. Tim uh, Gustafson tells this, this event that took place in his life. And he said that for years he had retold a story from a time in Ghana when he and his brother were toddlers. And as he recalled it, his brother had parked their old iron tricycle on top of a cobra, and the, the tricycle was heavy enough that it held the snake in place, and, and it remained trapped. And that's how he told the story, because that's how he remembered it. Well, he said that sometime after his, both his mom and his aunt had passed away, he discovered a long-lost letter from his mom recounting the incident. And in reality, the truth was, he said he learned that he had parked the tricycle on top of the snake, not the brother, and the brother had run to get help. And so here's the point. You see, her eyewitness recorded account brought the actual event to light, and it clarified the discrepancies. 
You say, what in the hound dog are we talking about this? Well, because, look in the book of Luke, and we'll see why. Luke chapter 1, where we see the very same thing taking place. Luke 1, verse 1, where Luke writes, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. In other words, the events that took place. An historical record has been recorded of what happened around Jesus Christ. Verse 2, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also. In other words, he says, I am going to record an accurate account also. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. And he's addressing one individual, most excellent Theophilus. Notice verse 4, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. What's he giving? He said, I'm giving an eyewitness account well compiled for you, Theophilus, and anyone else to know what actually took place, he being an eyewitness. Put a quote on the screen here by Dennis Fisher. said, Luke was a highly educated physician. We know this in the Greek academic tradition. So he's a very intelligent man, right? As a result, his word choice and grammar are eloquent and descriptive. We can be assured that what Luke writes is not based on hearsay, but is deeply rooted in a well-documented eyewitness record of Jesus as the Christ. Now now just pause and think about this for a moment. What am I saying? I'm saying we cannot, no one can rationally toss God's word out as something to not be recognized. I don't care if they're the, the greatest atheists of all times. God's word, the Bible, is recognized by historians all over the world as the most accurate ancient historical document in existence. So it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. You can't, you know, say, ah, that's just God's word. That, that is actually ignorant to do that. We have to accept it at a minimum as an accurate historical document. Let me read some more. I'll get the guys to put this on the screen. The presence of numerous eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, many of them hostile. Now think about that. You could say, well, you know, but yeah, Luke, um, he believed in Jesus, so he might write favorably. If they were... Many, many, many more eyewitnesses that were hostile towards Jesus, right? I mean, they've crucified him. That's pretty hostile, right? They were there. They were living in that era. They were there when this was being written. They were there when this was being shared publicly. They could have easily shut it down if it wasn't true, but they couldn't shut it down. All they could do was kill Christians, right? Why? Because they knew it was true. Let that bang in your heads. Let that bang in your heads. So many of them hostile who also have made it impossible for his disciples to spread lies about him. They couldn't spread lies. Next quote. goes on to say, furthermore, the gospel accounts were finished. Notice that they were completed while many such eyewitnesses were still alive. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Please, please get this. This is powerful. So, the, the, so God's word was finished, written, done, and, and spread abroad while these eyewitnesses, hostile eyewitnesses, were still living. They could have said, if they could have, this isn't true. It's a load of rubbish. But they couldn't because they knew it all took place. They knew Jesus' body was never found. <laughs> you know? They knew that. It goes on and says, had the gospel writers lied about what Jesus said or did, those eyewitnesses could have easily exposed their fabrications. But they didn't. Why? Because they couldn't. So I don't know where you are this morning. You're in different places, no doubt. Some of you... Believe God's word. That's great. Know this. Be encouraged by this and share it with people who are struggling over believing it's trustable. If you're struggling over the whole idea of Jesus Christ, can I believe in him and God's word? I beg you, please, please do not ignore God's word. At a minimum, as an accurate historical document of what took place. All right. Now we're going to shift gears. We are going to be allowed to see another side of Jesus Christ this morning. His kindness allows us to see this. We, we have seen a bit of his kindness. Obviously, he helps, he helps his family out in a dire situation there at this wedding. We'll see more situations where he reaches down to help those that we would have probably walked right past. But what we're going to see right now about Jesus is he is not a wimp. Okay? He is far from that. So let's go to the next verse we were coming to in John chapter 2, verse 12. John chapter 2, verse 12. 
And we will start there with verse 12. After this, he, Jesus, went to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And they stayed there for a few days. The Passover, as you know, a very, very significant uh, Jewish event. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. All right, let's pause just now, and let's understand the historical context of what's going on there. At the time of Passover, as you see there in verse 13, that's, that's the time that we're looking at right now. It was very, very important to the Jews. It was one of the three grand festivals. It was something that they participated in as a Jew. And if at all possible, they would travel to Jerusalem to participate because that's where the temple was. So what happened to Jerusalem's population during the, that week was like it has exploded. It was full of people. But what's also significant is that no matter how far away a Jew lived at that time, they would do their best to travel that tremendous distance to be there in Jerusalem. And, of course, it was difficult to bring a sacrifice with them over that distance. So what was established was the priest originally established something that was good. And they, they made the, the animals available to be purchased there on site so that they could have a sacrifice to offer. Something else we need to understand about that that era was that every male, 20 or older, was required to pay an annual temple tax. However, the tax had to be paid in either Jewish or Tyrian coins, so those traveling from other countries using a different currency, they would have to somehow exchange their foreign currency into the Tyrian currency. All right, so once again, they set up uh, a, a system there so they could exchange the money at the temple. That was all good and proper. Now let's keep reading, though. Something is going to happen. Verse 15. And making a whip of cords, this is Jesus, he drove them out, who? The money changers and the people selling livestock. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told, and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. We say, whoa, right? I thought, well, Pastor Joel, I thought you said what they were doing was okay. It was okay. But what happened was what happens often in our world is that greed took over. There was a, a dollar to be made. So why don't we make two dollars or three dollars instead of one dollar? And so the fees for the animals became exorbitant. And the, the fees for exchange of money climbed higher and higher. And we can assume the priests were getting their cut out of it. And you see, that is what Jesus was so disgusted about. And we see, I mean, we can assume there was some physical resistance against him. There were quite a few people involved here, but he sent them packing. So never see Jesus Christ as a wimp. Okay, guys and ladies, do not see him as that because he is far, far from that. He was a man in the fullest extent. In fact, Later, there are, the best we can understand in the New Testament, there were, this, this happened twice. This took place at the beginning of his time of ministry. Then later, just towards the end of his time of ministry, he cleans the temple out one more time. And in Matthew 21, verse 13, this is what he said about that. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. And so he stood up for his father in that case. He stood up for his father in that scene. And, and let's... Let's get, folks, the dynamic of what's happening here, of what, of what Jesus, on this occasion, and on a few other occasions, he's going to show us about himself. In kindness, he teaches us this about himself. Is that he, that, let's say it this way, there is a side of Jesus you don't want to be on. Okay? There's a side of Jesus you don't want to be on. Let me illustrate it this way. I'm going to pick on Aaron for a moment. I don't think he'll mind. Most of you have met Aaron. Uh, I've known Aaron a bit longer than you have. Aaron is one of the kindest men that I know, literally. Probably a good thing, right? Because he's a big guy, right? You know, and I don't want to be on the wrong side of Aaron, right? And I don't think you would either. I wouldn't be why I would want to. I don't know. I wouldn't want to be harming somebody that he loved, okay? I wouldn't want to be there, right? And you get why I'm saying that. Now, this is no insult to Aaron, but let's amp this up a trillion zillion times and get a bit of a picture 
what we're talking about with Jesus Christ. In kindness, there none can compare to him. But I say this not in any berating way. I say this in love. Don't find yourself on the wrong side of Jesus Christ. Do not find yourself there. That is not a place where any human being ever wants to be. What am I talking about? Let's see it a bit more. Remember last week we talked about the interpretive clue for John? What was that interpretive clue? You remember about John and his book? What was that? Yeah, that's right. He doesn't ever name himself in the book. Not once does he ever say, me, John. He doesn't do that. Um, what was one of the expressions he used? I'll get the guys to put it on the screen just to save time. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And so we, from different passages, we get an idea that there, there was a real bond between them. I mean, I read it a moment ago. He, he, he was, he, maybe it was more on John's part than Jesus. I'm sure Jesus loved all of them the same, but John got it maybe about Jesus. And he, they were close to each other. And um, you see that in that passage and all. Um, he loved him, and he was, he was close to him. Now, let's move forward three years to the end of Jesus' ministry. Hold your place in, where well, you can just leave your place in the beginning of John. Go to John 13 now. We're going to see a time, this is three years later. We're going to see this close relationship. This takes place now at a Passover, three years later. All right. It is, many of you are ahead of me here. You know what's, this is the night that Jesus is arrested, right? This is the time that he begins explaining about his betrayer. And notice verse, starting verse 21. So John 13, verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, notice this, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. Who's the one? It's John, right? So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus. You ask him. You ask him. Right? You ever do that? You ask him. I don't want to ask him. Of whom he was speaking. So that disciple... John, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? So you see this very close, intimate relationship. Now, now we want to jump forward. Because at this point, Jesus goes back to heaven. Now we want to jump forward about 60 years forward to a time that John, the same, the same apostle, John, receives a revelation, which we call what? The revelation in the Bible. He receives that. John is, is very elderly. Probably by this point, most of the other disciples have been put to death. John escaped death. I Many of you know this. This is not recorded in God's word, but ancient history teaches us that he was, he was dropped alive into boiling oil and somehow survived that, I guess by a miracle of God, and went on to live in prison and write the book of Revelation. John is transported to heaven to receive the book of Revelation. In Revelation 1.17, I'll get the guys to put it on the screen. Look what happens here. He comes before this same Jesus Christ that he's leaning against 60 years before. And it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, what's the difference here? You know, 60 years ago, he was leaning up against him, asking him a question. Now he stands before Jesus Christ and he's flat on his face like he's dead. What's the difference? When Jesus walked this earth, he often referred to himself as son of of man. You remember that expression, son of man. He, in doing that, was indicating to us, I am here still, the, the son of God, eternal existent, the creator of this universe, but I'm in my non-glorified appearance. You're not seeing me like I really am, okay? John saw him like he really is, and what did he do? He was plastered on the ground like he was dead. And, and, and catch me here now. This is simply... You see, John was on the right side of Jesus, right? He had received him as a Savior, and he's still plastered on the ground because simply of his glory. Now, let's see a bit more. more. Let's flash forward now a bit forward in history to Revelation chapter 20. And I'll get you to turn there. Easy to find. Go to the end of your Bibles. Revelation chapter 20. Almost at the end of the Bibles. And we're going to see once again an event in which Jesus is at the center of he is the spotlight. This is an event <clears throat> in which you need to understand that Jesus now stands as judge, not as Savior. Right now, for anyone in this room, he stands before you either as your personal Savior or as the one reaching out to be your Savior. But the day will come 
in which he will no longer be available as a savior. He will only be the judge. And this event graphically describes, this, this passage graphically describes that yet future event. So Revelation 20, verse 11, John describes, he says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. What is that saying? I don't know. I don't know if there's a human way to explain that. All it's saying is his presence is something. Okay? Verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they have done. Let me pause there just for a moment. So what's happening here? Books are open. Have you ever said to somebody, you know, what happens after you die? And they say, I, you know, I think my good's going to outweigh my bad. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I've heard that. I don't know how many times I've heard that said. That's, um, that's the game plan of religion. That's why I am, we are not religious. Okay? Religion is how can we work our way to God? Isn't that stupid? How could we? We can't. He's perfect. We never will be. Okay. But here's the shocking, really paralyzing thing. You know what? In the end... They get that chance because the books of their life are open. And we're going to see what happens to every single one of them. As horrible as it is, if their book's not, if their name's not written in the book, because verse 15 says, and if anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. How do we escape the lake of, fi lake of fire? Our name must be written in the book of life. How does that happen? We've got to be really, really good. No, thank goodness, because we can't. Our names are recorded in the book of life. When we turn from trying to live life our way and we turn to Jesus Christ, believe in him that he is the son of God, that he died for us, we receive him as our savior, we receive his forgiveness. At that moment, our name is written in the book of life, never, ever to be removed. That's our choice. That's everyone's choice. But you see, folks, and I'm, and I'm saying this once again, I'm not trying to be negative this morning. There is a side of Jesus Christ that you do not want to find yourself at. And we're seeing it here this morning. And Jesus, in kindness, warns us about that. There's a lady named Fiona Campbell. Get you guys to put the picture on the screen. Some of you may have, in 1994, you may, you may remember this if you were living in 1994. I know, some of you weren't even born yet then. I'm well aware of that. I was living then. You know that, don't you? But she did something that made her very, very famous. She, it took her 11 years to accomplish it, but she walked over 31,000 kilometers through five continents, becoming famous because she was the first woman to walk all the way around the world. However, her celebration didn't last long. All the adulation that came her way because something was eating at her. Something was bothering her. And, and this, this woman who had become so famous in that way, this dark cloud hung over her, literally bringing her to the brink of a nervous breakdown. What was bothering her? She had been dishonest, and she knew it. And she, for part of that time, had ridden in a truck the distance, not actually walking, and she knew that that broke the guidelines of the Guinness Book of World Record. And so finally, she comes clean, and she, can, she admits it, she cleared her conscience to her sponsors, and, um, and she went on to say, you know, she said, I cheated. She said, I shouldn't be remembered as the first woman to walk around the world. What are you saying, folks? That's what, that's what guilt does to us. We know that. Every one of us know that. We've been there. Maybe we're there right now. I don't know where you are this morning. You may be one who needlessly is continuing to carry your own weight of sin on yourself. You say, well, needlessly? Yeah, needlessly, because that's why he died on the cross. And he died for me, and he died for you. And he is there to take that guilt away. Because, you see, he's already paid for it. It's already paid for. He did that 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross. You say, well, why, aren't, why am I not forgiven? Because you haven't received it. This is like any gift. The New Testament describes salvation as a gift over and over and over again. Why? So we can understand. What do you do with the gift? You got a gift with your name on it? What do you do? You pay me for it? No, it's not a gift. You mow my loan for it? No, it's not a gift. You receive it. That's what forgiveness is. So why don't people do it? Well, because of pride, for one thing, because we have to admit we can't fix the mess. 
He alone can fix it. But let me just say this. It is that simple. Because for him, it was not simple. For him, it was horrific. But our horrific debt that we, need, we, that we owe, and if we haven't received this forgiveness, we will pay for all eternity. He's paid it for us. For the others, many others are sitting here and you're, and you're saying, yeah, that's right, he's paid my debt and, and I'm forgiven and that's great. Here's, here's the guilt we may be carrying right now is that there are people we know, friends and workmates, who don't know and we've not told them. And that's a, that's a, that's a guilt also. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it and the fact that we can know, we can know for sure that it is true, that there's no doubt about it. We thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to die on the cross for us. If you're here this morning and you have not received that forgiveness, please come to see me afterwards or catch up with somebody who, who, who you know or... Or do it on your own. Turn to Jesus Christ. Fall before him and receive his forgiveness. If you're here this morning and you know that event is taking place in your life and you're rejoicing because of it, who would God have you to tell this week? We've got a fresh supply of our cards on the table with the story on them. Who are you going to give one to this week? More than one. I urge us to commit this to Jesus Christ, to be used of him on the days we walk on this earth. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you care for us, you guide us, you enable us. We want to serve you and honor you the days we have left on this earth. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.